Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today, the best of Oklahoma gardening is all about animals in the landscape. Host Casey Hinches visits with OSU wildlife ecologist Tim O'Connell about enjoying birds in the winter months. We hear the buzz on our local bumblebees, follow the path of the monarchs. We burn the rough in an urban golf course to renew native plants and make a home for wildlife. And we see how planting buckwheat can help feed the pollinators during the hot summer months. Today we are joined by Dr. Tim O'Connell who is in the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department and he is one of our bird experts. And Dr. O'Connell, you're here today to talk to us about some winter care for birds. Yes, I am. People we, love to feed birds. I do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it's kind of our interest in the garden that time of year mm -hmm. as yeah. well. So um, you brought with you some different foods. I know there's always some question about should I buy the expensive? What, what do birds want to eat sure, this time sure. of year? So um, there are a bunch of things to consider. One of the things that's uh, really commercially available and pretty cheap would be a mix like that. Um, and this is probably how when most people are just starting to feed birds, that's, that's sort of what they'll do. Uh, but there's a lot of filler in here, and it's really not a lot of great uh, seeds for birds. Okay. For birds, the whole thing you're looking for, or what they're looking for, is a high fat content in the seed. And then a seed that they don't have to spend a lot of time cracking open to get that fat content inside. So um, more than this, I would recommend some uh, sunflower seeds. Okay. Now, sunflower seeds, you can get these great big gray striped ones, they call them, but those are pretty woody on the outside. And it's easy maybe for a cardinal to crack into that, but some of the smaller birds, it's not as easy. Right. So better is uh, what we call black oil sunflower seed. And that's the, the small sunflower seeds. They've got a really sort of soft husk and they're easy for uh, even chickadees or titmice to, or even goldfinches to get in there and then get that really nutritious um, sunflower heart. Uh, at, that's the part they're actually eating. Okay, all right. Yep. And for specialty uh, situations, maybe you've got a place where you don't want a bunch of sunflower husks accumulating on the, on the ground, you can just feed uh, sunflower hearts directly. So this is commercially available and this has the husks taken off. Okay, so the, the work's been done for them. Work's been done for Do they them. go through this a lot faster then? Or? They can. It's actually kind of funny. Sometimes they'll sit there and they'll still try to take the husk off because <laughs> that's just their sort Nature, of innate yeah. behavior. Um, but generally, they'll figure it out pretty quickly. And So this is, uh, this is nice uh, for a, a no-mess application, but it is a lot more expensive. Okay, yeah. and, and you've got some uh, non-seed <laughs> options here. There are some non-seed <laughs> options. These are mealworms. These are dried mealworms, and these are commercially available now. And a lot of birds will eat these. Chickadees will eat them, nuthatches, wrens. Uh, but so most seed, people... seed eating birds will eat these. Is that correct? Yeah, a lot of those birds, uh, a lot of chickadees and, and wrens and things like that, they're really generalists. Okay. Uh, and, in, and in the summertime especially, they'll take a lot of insect food. Okay. That's mostly what they're feeding their babies. Um, but other things like uh, bluebirds will mm -hmm. love to come to um, sort of dried mealworms. All so, right. Yeah. And, and can we mix these together? I mean, make a little trail mix for our birds? You, or You can do that. Okay. Yeah, you, the way I look at it is you can do kind of whatever you want. Okay. Um, but what I do for just uh, simplicity's sake and for attracting the largest number of birds is just offer this uh, black oil as okay. my standard. Okay. And then I'll, you know, throw out some peanuts or something like that just to, as a little treat, a little extra treat sometime. Okay. And so do we need to feed the birds this time of year or I mean are they dependent on, on bird food no. that we provide? No, birds have been here a lot longer than we have okay. and they know how to find food and it's uh, it's natural foods especially where you've got a lot of great uh, you know native plants planted and native trees you're gonna have abundant foods available for your native birds. Okay. The other thing is uh, overwintering insects so things like uh, if you're looking you got some pine trees here it's a nice sort of corrugated bark and underneath those flakes of bark there are a lot of overwintering uh, insects and spiders and other invertebrate foods Foods. And that's what chickadees and wrens would have been eating historically. Okay. Yeah. Um, so 
what I tell people, when, if you want to feed birds, do it for you because you want birds close to your house or you want to be able to, to see them and watch them, um, but the birds don't really need it. Okay. But if you do start feeding birds, keep going later into the winter and the early spring because that's when their natural foods are at their lowest availability. Okay. So they've kind of created that habit that you're providing it and then you don't want to leave them high and dry in the middle. Kind of a jerky thing to do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Them in, the old classic bait and switch. Noted, noted. Yeah. Okay, so of course, uh, are there different types of feeders for these different things or what have you found to be the best option for that? You can spend a lot of money on fancy feeders. Mm -hmm. uh, you can spend a little bit of money on really cheap feeders. But no matter what, they're all going to fall down. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so what I look for is something that when it falls is not going to break. So this is a design that I found, again, that's com commercially available that I really like. And, and the you thing just I, got this at a local store here? Yep, or? just okay. at local stores Feed here store? in, in Stillwater. Yep. Okay. And uh, it's all metal construction and it's real sturdy. This is marketed as a peanut feeder. Okay. Uh, and you can feed peanuts if you want. That gets a little expensive. <laughs> well, but I just put my sunflower seed in here and it works great. Um, birds that can cling to things will come and just take one seed at a time usually. Chickadees will do that, uh -huh. chipmice will do that. Um, so they'll take one seed, fly off to a branch and then open up the seed there and then come back. So they eat one at a time and the seed lasts in there a good long time. Um, but of course what's going to happen is a squirrel is going to get over here <laughs> and the squirrel is going to open this lid and reach in and, and get a snack. So, uh, so at some point, this is going to fall down, and you just want to make sure you, it's still going to be workable after uh, you pick it up. The but it's next pretty day heavy duty. It's heavy duty, right? So, are, you mentioned birds that will be able to cling to the side of that. Are there birds that like to kind of roost on a, a stick or something? And could you put a, a stick between there to kind of allow them to do that? Yeah, it's... you could. And then uh, there's some uh, there's some things we'll call seed tray that you'll stick on the bottom okay. of this, so it'll be a um, chance for something like uh, or a goldfinch or a house finch. They'll sometimes like to just sit there. Okay. And uh, and take the seed rather than take one at a time. All right. But you know, as you're indicating, birds feed in different ways, and some of them really, like a morning dove, is never going to come and cling to a feeder that's okay. hanging. They feed from the ground. Um, so I always also spread some seed on the ground. Okay. You know, to make sure I'm feeding the widest variety of species that are there. Excellent. So yeah. what kind of birds are we seeing this time of year? And will they be around in the summer or they migrate and they're just here in the winter time? All of the above. Okay. <laughs> right? So um, here at the garden, we've had a wonderful uh, hour or so looking around at the birds coming into the, the uh -huh. feeders here at the garden. And that includes uh, local species that are here year round. Uh, Carolina chickadee, tufted titmouse. They're here eating uh, from our feeders in the winter. And then come the breeding season for them, it'll be sort of April or May. Uh, they will switch over to an almost completely insect diet for the summer. Okay. What about cedar waxwings? I know we mentioned those earlier. Everybody loves cedar waxwings, <laughs> and, and here in Oklahoma, we typically see them in the winter. Okay. And especially when they're sort of moving through in late winter, they typically don't breed in our state. They're they're more of a farther north breeder. Okay. So you get them in the winter time moving around with roving flocks of American robin, and there's usually a few yellow rump warblers in there. And these are all species that will eat fruits in the winter time. Cedar waxwings are looking for fruits that have um, reached a point at which they're more palatable. Uh, for some of our hollies, maybe that's not till later in the winter after they've been through a few frosts. And that can make them more easily to digest. Sometimes that actually builds up their alcohol content and you get some <laughs> drunk wax wings. Oh, no. um, but yeah, that's really what they're looking for. They're sort of hitting different fruits at different points throughout the winter. All right, well, thank you for all of this information. It's been great. I'm always happy to do it. My name is Terry Cock and I'm from the Department of Integrative Biology. Today I'm going to talk to you about bumblebees in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, we historically have about 10 species of bumblebees uh, that are native to the state. You'll typically find about four or five, though, in the wild recently as the others are critically endangered or declining rapidly. Here today we have two female bumblebees. Um, they are both of the same species. They are uh, the American bumblebee. Uh, you can tell that they are female bees because they have pollen baskets on the side of them. Those are known as cobricular baskets. And any female bumblebee will have pollen matted on the side of their legs that they are collecting to take back to the nest. Bumblebees typically emerge in March and April. The emerging queens 
are coming from overwintering and they will build their own nest typically in rotted out wood, um, leaf litter. You will find them in your yard, usually in burrows as they typically are underground. You will not find large nests like you do honeybees inside of trees. Um, they'll mostly be on the ground nesting. They do form a colony of about anywhere from 20 to 400 individuals with the most common size kind of around 100 uh, working bees. The bees typically live two to six weeks and they will have a life cycle from about March, the whole colony as a whole from March until about September, October here in Oklahoma. Once they are um, into the later in the year, queens will lay eggs that have other female bees that can reproduce. These female bees will go off and find their own nest to overwinter in. So if you see a large bee in your yard, more than likely it could be a carpenter bee or a bumblebee. The difference would be that a carpenter bee is shiny on its end, whereas a bumblebee is fuzzy. Overall, neither carpenter bees nor Bumblebees or any other bee in your yard is particularly dangerous as if you disturb them, they will protect their nest, but they are crit critical pollinators for the native plants in Oklahoma and they are all declining. So if you do find bumblebees, make sure to take care of them and help them by planting native plants. I'm here at the Botanic Garden at OSU looking for monarch butterflies. Um, it's been an interesting year for the monarch migration, especially if you compare it to uh, the past recent years, so uh, perhaps since 2015. Um, so the migration has been late in previous years. Um, uh, warm temperatures in the upper Midwest slowed the migration, so we didn't have monarchs here well into October, um, and the migration kind of trailed out um, and lasted for quite a long time. Uh, this year was different. There were cooler temperatures um, up uh, farther north, and so the migration moved through very quickly. Uh, we have reports of monarchs both to the east, the west, and the south of Stillwater, but we haven't seen very many in Stillwater itself. So usually when we're looking for monarchs, uh, thinking about tagging and, and recording uh, information about the migrants as we look for uh, good conditions. So a lot of times we think about when we have winds coming out of the north, when those shift to coming out of the south, that will kind of stall the migration. And then we'll usually have a lot of monarchs uh, drop down into the area. And it's usually good timing for uh, tagging and uh, weighing and measuring and, and looking at other aspects of the, of the monarch migration. Uh, this year, we've consistently had winds out of the north. Um, and so the monarchs moved through quickly and uh, didn't stop to nectar. So they, they moved by um, higher up. And so uh, we have, Usually we're catching well over a thousand monarchs um, each year, and this year um, we're at less than 10. Uh, so I caught number nine today here at the, <laughs> at the Botanic Garden. Um, and so uh, interesting year, but hopefully a good sign for the monarch population um, in terms of them making it to Mexico earlier, um, and then more of them uh, making it through that migration um, and uh, hopefully doing well over the winter, but, but time will tell. I also wanted to provide an update about some of our mowing studies. Um, a lot of people have noticed the signs that we have um, out on 51 where we have uh, mowing plots. Um, I collaborate with uh, Dennis Martin uh, on looking at different mowing regimes and the effect on uh, milkweed plants as well as nectar plants and, and monarchs. Uh, so, and there's starting to be more research coming out in the area of mowing. Um, and so the timing of mowing will influence uh, the regrowth of the milkweed plants as well as other uh, wildflowers. And so what we find is that the monarchs prefer that uh, tender regrowth um, or new growth in some cases. Um, and so they, they do preferentially lay eggs on those, those milkweed plants. 
Um, in terms of other resources for monarchs, so thinking about nectar plants for the fall migration, uh, the mowing uh, affects different species differently. Uh, so in some cases you might be able to mow um, and then extend the time period in which uh, species might be blooming. So there would be other non-mowed areas. Uh, so for example, in adjacent grassland that would have species that were blooming at kind of the regular time. And then with mowing, you might be able to shift that blooming period a little bit later. So extending the time period that we have good resources available for monarchs. Today we're in a very urban environment talking about horticulture and prescribed burning at a location that a lot of people probably wouldn't think about. Joining us today is John Cooper Vage, who is the Natural Resource Manager here at Tinker Air Force Base. And a lot of times when we talk about Tinker, we think airplanes, not natural resources. But John, tell us a little bit about your role and what's going on today. Well, you know, we're a, we're a federal agency and we have land to manage and we've got to be good stewards of that land and prescribed fire is one of the ways that we do that. And, and, and today is late February, so we're talking about burning here because this is the time where there's a lot of fuel. Explain kind of the challenges about burning on a base here. Well, um, on this particular base, we've got over 700 buildings. We've got two main runways. We've got I-40 on one side, I-240 on the other. 30,000 people, you've got a lot of activity going on. So we have to be very aggressive and, and really relentless with our communications to make sure we've got everybody engaged and everybody involved both on base and off base to make sure they understand, hey, we're burning. This smoke is coming up because we're doing a prescribed burn out here, not something else. Yeah, so you want to make sure everybody's aware of what's Absolutely. going on. And tell us a little bit about the team that's here helping you. This team is from the Air Force Wildland Fire Center. They're out of San Antonio. And we've got folks that come in, and these guys are wildland fire experts. That's what they do. And so they come on the base, and uh, they basically execute the burn for us. We have, it's basically a team effort. We as biologists on the base set up the, the, the prescription and what we want to do to make sure we meet certain objectives, whether it's for fuel reductions to remove cedars, or whether it's to improve wildlife habitat, whether it's to improve aesthetics. Um, you know, whether it's something to do with the airfield environment, whatever that is, we set those objectives up, and then these guys come in and execute. So John, we're currently burning in kind of a rough area of a golf course here on base, but you've got a lot of land that's in private, public, in housing areas. Tell us a little bit of what you're burning. Right, so here on the golf course, we've got out of play areas. So these were areas that it, it costs us to maintain these areas. So um, instead of mowing these routinely, these out of play areas were converted to prairie or, or in the process of being converted to a prairie. And fire is gonna be the way that we maintain that. Other areas on base, like over in our housing area, we had houses that were demolished. New houses were built in privatized housing. Um, when those houses were demolished, we had this land. What are we gonna do with it? It was floodplain area. We've got federal executive orders that require us to manage that in certain ways. And so that's what we did. And, and what we did was to convert it to prairie. And so it, it's a floodplain area. It functions to, to, by converting it to prairie. It allows us to filter water, gives us better water quality. It gives us the flood storage we need on base to uh, make sure that we don't impact the mission when we have uh, large, you know, heavy rain events. And so uh, that's, that's what we've decided to do with that particular piece of land. It's prairie and we're maintaining it with fire. So John, overall the whole base, how many acres do you have that will be burned? Well, currently this year we're burning uh, 215. Last year we burned 130. So it's, it's ramped up a little bit this year. We may have a total of about 500 that we would burn over the course of the next five years. Uh, we won't always burn that many every year. Uh, we'll eventually get into a rotation where we'll burn maybe a third of it in a year, and then the next year we'll burn another third, and the next year another third, so we'll be on a three-year rotation. So these prairie areas and these, these natural areas are scattered across the base. We've got them at different locations. Um, and for us, urban burning is just really, really critical. Um, you know, the, the fuel load management is, is really important. Um, to make sure that we're not going to do anything that's going to impact the mission in a negative way, especially if we got cedars down around the runways or that kind of, uh, of an area. So, um, so this helps us to, to maintain those areas and keep them in a, in a state where we don't have those hazards. Yeah, and obviously being on an Air Force base, I mean, there's definite priorities um, about 
airplane safety and, and smoke, I would imagine, and, and that sort of stuff. Can you speak to a little bit about the precautions that are being taken today? Right, so for example, when we burn on the south end of the airfield, we burn with a north wind, so it carries smoke away from the airfield. When we burn on the north end of the airfield, we're burning with a south wind carrying the smoke north. So we're trying to keep smoke from getting onto the airfield itself. Um, but we have to deal with the same kind of thing across the base. We've got housing areas. We don't want smoke going into the housing area. We've got our neighbors off base. We don't want smoke going there. So we burn in certain ways to get the smoke to lift and get out of here. We've got to make sure it's under a certain prescription so that we can achieve those goals. And how's the wind today doing for us? The wind today has been a real challenge. Um, it's, uh, it was forecasted to be an east wind, southeast wind. Uh, we had it buck up to a west wind at one point, and that's, that can be a real problem. And so we've got to be cautious with how we do things. And uh, the, the wind speeds today were lower than normal. It was at the low end of our prescription. So it was down around five miles an hour, six miles an hour. When you get there, sometimes the winds can get variable. So the fire may not go the direction you want it to go. So that prescription is critical. Right. If it's outside the prescription, we don't burn. All right, and this has been an ongoing process. This isn't the only day and you'll continue on? How, how long is the interval for burning? Right, we burn from January 1 till the end of March. That, that's our window. And that's because we have certain objectives, certain things we're trying to accomplish. And uh, we've burned, this is our fifth day that we've burned out here, and we are about 75% complete. All right, well, John, thank you so much. And I think a lot of times we don't think about Tinker and the natural resources, but we're glad that you're on top of this. And this is just the beginning of several segments that we're gonna come down and talk with you about. Um, we're gonna talk about the actual establishment of these prairies, and also a few little horny toad critters that you've That's got around right. here. Looking forward to it. Excellent, thank you so much, John. Thank you, Casey. This, uh, we're here at the, uh, at the West Watkins Research and Extension Center at Lane, Oklahoma, and I'm standing out in a planting of, of uh, buckwheat. Uh, the reason we're growing this buckwheat here is to provide a food source for honeybees. Uh, and is, I'm, I'm, I'm just surrounded by almost a swarm of bees here that are working on these flowers, so, so they're very busy. Uh, buckwheat is known to be a, a, a very good uh, food source for honeybees. It's, it, 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 it's a nectar that the bees can use to make a what we consider a very good uh, quality honey. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons this is here. Now uh, this, this uh, planting of buckwheat is part of a, a, a much larger project. Uh, uh, he was not able to be here today but I've been working with a local beekeeper and uh, as I got to, as we discussed uh, honey raising bees in this area one thing he told, that he told me is we have a problem in the summer in that there's uh, many times we have long periods, especially in hot, dry summers, we'll have periods when there's just no, no uh, good food source for the honeybees. So, so what we started doing is, is kind of uh, thinking about some of the different crops that we could be growing throughout the, basically to, uh, to keep something there, uh, you know, maybe 10 months of the year, that pollinators could be, uh, the pollinators, in particular honeybees, could be using as a nectar source to keep them uh, with a good food supply through all, throughout the months that they're active. So, uh, we st last year was the first year for this project. We we put together a list of some of the different things we thought that might might make good uh, good crops to provide this uh, this uh, nectar source. And we had several different uh, clovers last summer, one Hubam clover, uh, which is a white clover, some yellow clover. We also had some okra, a particular variety that we saw in the literature that was, that was uh, uh, supposed to be a good, uh, a good food source for honeybees. We had some southern peas, it was another one out there. Uh, and what else? And we also had some sesame last year. So. Uh, sesame is, is, is something that it, it not only has the flowers but it also has nectaries that, that provide that provide nectar as a food source for the bees. So, so uh, again, after with the experience we've had so far, uh, what you're looking for what to, for this is you want a crop that, that will uh, be producing that would be flowering and, and, and providing that food source for as long a period of possi as possible. But you also want something that you can plant and have flowers uh, there and, and available for the bees as quickly as possible. 
it, it's the buckwheat is turning out to, to fit that that bill very well. Uh, we this buckwheat planting here is about uh, uh, I think maybe five or six weeks old, and as you can see, it, it's in full bloom and and and, and keeping the bees uh, bees very occupied. Some of the other ones we looked at again, the okra and the peas, they were much longer uh, periods to grow them up and get them to where they are flowering, and then they really didn't begin to have the 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 volume of flowers that you have here with the buckwheat. So. So what we're kind of looking at doing is is to use sequential plantings of buckwheat uh, throughout the throughout the uh, growing month. Begin once we get past the frost, frost free period, we can plant the buckwheat and and just you know every maybe three or four weeks plant an additional uh, additional area. Uh, again, our our beekeeper our beekeeper keeps his bees down at the end of this field here, uh, and he's been uh, as you can see the the uh, the hives are getting taller. He needs to add additional supers. To, to have to provide more space for the bees to be uh, for the colony to develop and to store the honey and all so uh, I guess I'm not a bee expert so I can't tell you too much about that but again he's very very happy with what he's seeing here with with the uh, crops such as the sesame and the buckwheat next week we'll be partaking in herbs Casey will have her pruners out in the herb garden to go through the process of cutting, drying, and storing herbs for use throughout the season. Barbara Brown will show how to safely infuse certain herbs in oil and will freeze the bountiful basil to extend the harvest. Until then, we wish you health and wellness, and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.